welcome to the Happy Lawyer Project. I'm your host, Akoma Moronu, and I created the show to help lawyers find happiness in life with a law degree. Together with my guests, we provide the knowledge, skills, insight, and inspiration you need to find your happy. Hey there, lawyers. So I have some pretty big news to share. Well, I don't have big news to share at this point. I have news to share, which will eventually lead to big news. But we are making some really big changes in our lives over here. So I've had to do a lot of work around how to create space for all these change and how to really focus on the things that are really moving my life forward. As a result, I am going to have to put the podcast on hold for now. I will continue airing episodes through the end of August, and then the plan currently is for me to take the rest of the year off. I will hopefully be back with a new and better, stronger version of something in January, but I really am going to spend the rest of the year trying to put something better together for you guys. That being said, I know that I've been spending a lot of time in my DMs on Instagram, going back and forth with a number of you guys trying to help you guys work through the things you're struggling with and really figure out your own path to happiness. In the interest of doing what I love to do best, which is really create an impact in this community that I love so, so much, I've decided to do something that I don't do that often. I am going to open up my calendar for 10 strategy intensive. So basically what I'm saying is if you're struggling with something and you want my one-on-one help to work through that, This is your very rare opportunity to do that. I don't do it that often because usually my schedule is super jam-packed, but because I'm taking the podcast off my schedule, I'm going to have more time. So basically what this would include is a 90-minute call with me where you guys would share what you're struggling with, what you're working on, what you're trying to accomplish, and we could really dive into where you're getting stuck and figure out a plan for getting you unstuck and to finish out the year strong. We'll put that plan in place and then we'll have a 45 minute follow up call a few weeks later to make sure the plan is still working for you and make any tweaks to that plan. So it's a pretty intensive time together, but it will really, I think, have the power to put you on the right track for the rest of the year if that's what you need at this point in your journey. So as you guys know, I don't do this that often, so it's a pretty big deal. (laughs) And these spots usually go pretty quickly. So if you're interested in a spot, please feel free to send me a DM on Instagram at the happy lawyer project. And I'll send you more information about how to get on my schedule, how to pay for the intensive and how we can start working together. So let's get to today's guest. I'm really excited to introduce today's guest. She's actually a member of my mastermind. So I get to work closely with her as a colleague, but today I get to have her on as a guest. And she is the founder of a boutique women's only law firm, Mayor Law Group, which specializes in employment and privacy law. When she built her firm, she wanted to build a firm that afforded women the flexibility that they desired. So she leveraged technology to build a completely virtual firm. She's also the founder of Joy in the Law, which aspires to bring together attorneys interested in exploring various aspects of happy lawyering. Hmm, sound familiar? I know, it's crazy that we had never heard of each other until we were in a mastermind together. And on today's show, Diana and I chat about how she runs a value-based virtual firm, things to consider if you'd like to join a virtual practice, and what she's learned about happiness in the practice from leading Joy in the Law. I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Happy Lawyer Project, lawyers. I am really excited to introduce you guys to today's guest. She's somebody who I've actually admired from afar and up close for a while. She may not know this. She's one of my favorite people that I get to mastermind with, the amazing Diana Mayer. So for people who don't know, could you give people a brief description of who you are and what it is that you do? Yeah. So I live in the San Francisco Bay Area in Marin County. I have two children, a son and a daughter, and I'm married. And I have a boutique employment firm and we do some data privacy, but not about 90% of what we do is employment law related. And my employees are really all over the Bay Area. I have an office in San Rafael, which is in Marin County, but my employees are all over the Bay Area. My clients are all over the Bay Area and really beyond the Bay Area. And Mayor Law Group has seven attorneys right now, and then another three or four contract attorneys, and I've got two admin paralegal people. So boutique firm, we're not a kind of traditional law firm. 
we're very intentional in what we do. We do do a lot of kind of standard advice and counsel work and some litigation defense and things like that. But we do a lot of stuff that goes beyond risk and risk assessment. We really focus on creating happy workplaces through workplace trainings and conflict resolution workshops and workplace mediations. And I do a lot of coaching these days, like executive coaching. And we do a lot of workplace investigations, which tend to be a way to kind of root out problems and address systemic issues that are going on in the workplace. So we have, in some ways, a very non-traditional practice. I am so fascinated by your practice because when you say all those things to me, they sound very exciting. And when you think of like employment law, for some reason, that to me is not <laughs> that exciting. You know I, mean? I, just, I always joke with my fellow in-house lawyers. We have two who do employment law and they say they would never want to do what I do. And I say I would never want to do what they do. But when you talk about the culture of a workplace and yeah, the fact that you exactly. get to impact that through your work is really interesting. I mean, I think it's a very sexy area of the law and I'm not being facetious. I mean, I was a public defender right out of law school, which I loved and the work was fascinating and the clients were fascinating and the stakes were so high. And I mean, it was a really cool job and it was a calling. This is a second best thing. I mean, that was not a particularly sustainable career for me, wanting to have a family and whatnot. But this, you know, the cases are juicy, the issues are juicy. I feel like you can really make a positive impact. And this is a, a good second choice if I'm not going to be doing criminal defense work. How did you make the choice? I don't know if I really made the choice. I think the choice kind of came to me, like a lot of things that happen in life. I, When I decided to leave the public defender's office, nothing in civil law sounded particularly interesting to me after what I was doing and, you know, being in the courtroom all day, every day. But I was very feminist identified and women's rights identified. And I was talking to some women that were prosecuting sexual harassment cases, basically. And you know, from the plaintiff's perspective. And that sounded really neat. And so that's originally how I got into employment law. I did plaintiff's side work and I went after cases from this perspective of employees I thought had been wronged. Interesting. So when you set up your firm, did you have a clear vision for what you were trying to create? Yes and no. I mean, (laughs) I think that I had some strategy and You know, I think I'm a person who is very heavy on passion, vision, ideas, and I have a very, very strong kind of moral and ethical compass and a strong sense of integrity. Like I have to do what I believe or I just am not right in the world. That said, I'm not always great at breaking down the work that needs to be done into bite-sized chunks or like figuring out how do I take this vision and make it a reality. So To some extent, it was like closing my eyes and feeling around in the dark and just going, that doesn't feel quite right, but this does. And so just doing that was some of what I was doing was just like, okay, I know I don't want this. I think I want more of that. But yeah, so there was some strategy behind it and some of it was just like one hire at a time and what did I want and what was I looking for and who were the kind of attorneys that I thought would be drawn to Mayor Law Group that I would also want to have work for me. I'm really surprised to hear you say that because from my perspective, you just seem so organized and so thoughtful (laughs) and so clear visioned. So to hear that you don't have that level of clarity or the details in place in your mind, I guess is somewhat reassuring to me. (laughs) (laughs) Do any of us really? I mean, I would love to be more of a detailed person. That is definitely not my strength. And I think I'm good at one of the reasons I think I've been fairly successful is I'm not shy about asking for help in the areas that I suck at. And I know very well the areas that I suck at, like details. But I don't know, in this day and age, in this world, sometimes I think the best we can hope for is to have a strong vision and just let that guide us because you just never know what's going to come your way, you know? So I feel like if you have that strong vision, that's the thing that should kind of be leading you around, not the other way. And so I do really wish I had the detail part of it, but I also am keenly aware that none of us get it all. And so I just try to surround myself with people that are good at things that I'm not good at. So this is something I struggle with because... 
I also am a big picture thinker. I'm a transactional lawyer, so I am really good at managing large projects. I can see how all the pieces are supposed to fit together mm-hmm. and I can move a deal to close, but like don't enjoy actually doing the detailed work. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's probably why I was so successful in the big law context is because I like to do the big picture structuring of a financing. I understand how to structure a deal. But then when it comes to like checking signature pages and like making sure things, I'm like, ugh. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like that's, that's not fun. Who wants to do that? I would rather just come up with the ideas. Correct. So how do you train someone or identify people who have strengths that are different than your own? Like obviously I can tell if someone's good at what I'm good at because I know it really well. Yeah. I mean, I think it's different in different cases, but I can tell you that like one of my big hires was a woman, Brittany Botchworth, who's actually about to leave the firm. And she is great because she's a real foil to me. Like she is great at systems and she has a spreadsheet for everything. And she is just super micro organized. And we always kind of joke because she's shooting down my ideas and she just kind of jokes around that she's a killjoy, but that's exactly what I want. I don't want to be surrounded by yes people. You know, I need somebody who will keep me in check. So she worked with me on the Joy in the Law conference that I planned the first time I planned it. She had taken a long period of time off to raise her son, who was, I think, 13 at that point. And so she was getting back in and she did a lot of volunteer work. And I, I was just watching her go doing this volunteer role for the Joy in the Law conference we were planning. And I just said, wow, she has really got something. And so even though she really had no employment law experience, she had some, that's not true. She had some because she'd been in-house at a hospital as like a GC doing a little bit of everything. But it wasn't an area of heavy expertise like it was for most of my other hires. But I could see that she really had something in terms of her ability to process the details. And she had a great sense of humor about things that would trip me up. And so essentially I hired her just a little bit sight unseen, not knowing the work she could do. She was obviously really, really smart. And she was a great hire. So in your firm, you afford your attorneys quite a bit of flexibility, both in their schedule and kind of in their location. How do you do that? What systems did you have to put in place and kind of what challenges have you faced? Because I know that Mm -hmm. so many people are looking for that and I'd be interested to know kind of how you set that up to make it work. Yeah, it's tricky. But I mean, I do really believe in that and, and I like what we have. And I think the women who work for me like what we have. I think one thing that I did was I had sort of a data security audit because, you know, given that we do data privacy, I felt like it's really important that we're doing a good job with this. So I hired a firm to basically audit our processes and to give us recommendations on how to be more secure. So, you know, we don't have an office. We don't have one centralized server that we can kind of lock up and make sure is secure. So we had to look at how we were sharing information, passing information electronically. So we started implementing systems around that, using password management software, getting a secure box account where we would keep everything, figuring out what kind of emails we would want to send password protected, and really getting a pretty vigorous assessment of what things we were doing that that were safe and good and what things we were doing that were not So there's things like that, you know, it's like the systems approach and where's all this information and how's it going and we're a law firm and this information is super important and if we lose it or it gets intersected by somebody, that's a problem. And then there's the more emotional nuances of no one being in the same place very often. And that has been a little bit tricky, but every couple of weeks we meet and do like a half day meeting in person. And we have calls that are set up and we do those to kind of keep in touch. And we have things we communicate over Slack and things like that. But it can be a little hard partially because there can be a big variance in how much people are working and what they're doing during the day. And I really don't have any control over that. I don't really want to control that. So I just have to hire people that have a good work ethic and I give some guidelines on the amount of hours that I want them to be working. We do track our hours, all our hours, whether billable and non-billable, because some people may not have a lot of billable work on their plate, but they're doing a lot for the firm in non-billable work. So there's a lot of different systems and processes, and it's always a work in progress. We're always refining it and trying to make it better. 
It was a great answer. And I think it answers a lot of the main concerns that people have, especially around one, communication, and then two, creating those relationships when everybody is remote and you don't have that natural proximity to each other. And that's one of the things that when I think about the future of the profession and this desire for more independence, like how does a large firm replicate that? Because you're still small enough and you're still in a small enough geographic space that you could do that half day meetings every couple of weeks, but it would be hard to get 500 people in a one place. And I don't even know that you would want to, right? Right. There is some variation on it that you could do, but it's an interesting thought exercise for me. Mm, yeah. I do have a client that I know, for example, there are probably 200 people and they, they're all basically virtual. And then every year they get together for like a week in some place because they're actually multinational as well. They all get together for a week someplace and then they have these different ways they communicate. It's not easy. That said, I think it's really important. And I wish that these bigger firms would take bigger risks because I think it's really easy to say you want to break the through the glass ceiling. You want women to be partners and all that, more women and roles of leadership. But unless you're willing to, I mean, the bottom line is that a lot more women than men want a lot more out of their lives. They want to really be involved as moms or members of their community or what, whatever it is and do the work. And that requires flexibility. So I will say, I mean, I think one thing that my employees do is, you know, most of us are not, we're available a lot, you know, beyond nine to five hours. So there's trade-offs for the flexibility. You know, none of us really, I know I don't ever feel like I'm really off call. I will talk to a client on the weekend if they need I'm very happy to make that trade-off for the flexibility I have. So again, I think there are ways that it lends itself to a lot of productivity and being an even better attorney. And I wish more firms were taking the risk of just doing it and seeing how it works out. Absolutely. And I think you see some of it. And my concern is it does feel sometimes like it pits people against each other. Mm -hmm. So at my firm, they had a flex time program that parents could opt into. And there was probably a couple dozen of us at the firm who had like a full-time flex schedule. And it wasn't like we didn't have a reduced pay. We didn't have reduced billable hours. We just didn't have to be in the office all the time. And it was open to both men and women. And it was primarily women who took advantage of it. And people had made partner on the flex schedule. Like it was possible, but it was such a small group of us that it wasn't really impactful. It's really interesting. Yeah. And it, like to some extent, right, you've got to normalize this before it really takes off, especially in the, the kind of people who become lawyers and the, the way that law is practiced in this day and age. Conformity is so important when checking all the right boxes. There's got to be some normalizing of this before it's going to really take off and be accepted as a viable practice. There's something else you've mentioned, which is your integrity and how important it is for you to live and practice in integrity. And in line with that, you include your values on your firm website. And yeah. I thought that was an interesting choice. I mean, we talk about values all the time, about corporate values, about personal values. It's clear why you made that decision, but how does that impact your business and how did you identify those values? Yeah, good question. I think I just sat down one day and said, okay, what are sort of the key values that I hold dear? And then at that point, I had just two other attorneys that were working for me. And I think I just wrote them out and then said, what do you think of these? What have I left out? How would you modify these? And that's essentially what we did. You know, we just wrote down how we practice law, the kinds of values that we held as people. But, you know, there's just things like that that I thought a lot about. Like, what would I want from an attorney? I mean, you know, I wanted excellent customer service. And a big part of that was I would want an attorney who would say, you know, we really, that was really a miss. And I'm really sorry about that. And like, how can we make it right? I like that you identified that specific value because I thought that one was very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that that level of humility is often lacking. <laughs> you think? <laughs> <laughs> In the law profession. And it's funny because I think people think that it undermines them as lawyers. Exactly. Which is so ridiculous. And as people too, like I can say as a mom, there are times when I just have a huge miss in what I do. You know, I had something that happened a few months ago where I just 
had lost my temper with the kids so bad. I was like screaming at the top of my lungs. I'm, and I'm not really a big yeller. I'm with them. I'm pretty good about being patient, but it was just a whole bunch of things. And they partially, I think, because they were not used to seeing me like that. They were just so scared and freaked out. And about two minutes later, after giving myself a timeout, <laughs> I came back and <laughs> apologized and they said, which was very sweet, they said, Mom, we were so bad. You you know, we were being so awful. You don't owe us an apology. And I said, Yes, I do. This is not okay. It's never okay for me to be out of control like that. I'm your mom and you should feel safe around me. And you're gonna see that your dad and I make mistakes. We just do just like you guys do. And and so it helped me not be so hard on myself, even though I was kind of appalled at my own conduct to say, you know, I'm modeling for them that I can apologize and that I'm not perfect. And that admitting that I'm not perfect is a a very healthy thing to do. And normalizing that this is what we do in life is that we own our mistakes. I love that. And I think it's so important as parents to live our values in front of our children. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you use your values in your business? Like, do you use it to give feedback to the other attorneys? Do you use it to make decisions? How are they utilized day to day? I think we do. I mean, and to some extent, you know, it's not like I go and I look at our values on a frequent basis. One is we treat everyone with dignity and respect. I mean, that is just really core to who I am. I'm not going to hire anyone who I feel like doesn't do that and things like that. But for example, I have a value, we understand the importance of giving and receiving appreciation. And I will just sometimes realize in retrospect, like that was a miss. I could have given some really good feedback there and could have praised that person and I didn't. And so things like that, remembering, oh yeah, this is a really important value. This is something that really matters to me and it probably matters to that person too. And then going back and saying, hey, I just wanted to tell you that I didn't say this at the time, but the way that you did that report or whatever was really great. And I also try to reflect what it is about that person, not just, okay, you did a good job here, but what it is about them as a person that makes them good at what they do or made my life easier or what I appreciate about them as a person. So there are things like that. Like I try to back up every once in a while and think about what am I putting out there? And what are we putting out there? And are do we need to refine that? I would think that having values written down and out in the open like that really helps to create a culture around them. But the thing I was thinking about as you were saying that, and as you were talking about needing to communicate feedback and things like that, is because you don't have that face-to-face and that day-to-day interaction, do you feel that you do have to spend a lot more time and intention around creating a culture and around communicating in order to keep everybody aligned? Or do you feel that you've really hired people who are naturally aligned? I think I've hired people that are pretty naturally aligned. You know, one of the things that I will say, I mean, Mirror Law Group is I mean, we have a ridiculous billable hour requirement. I mean, a lot of weeks, people may be billed 20 hours a week. So this is a lifestyle firm in the extreme. I think people are making market salaries when you consider the billable hours that they're billing and how much they're working. I mean, we're working a fraction of what most attorneys and corporate firms are working. So they have to be drawn. I mean, they're they're going to take a pay cut from a corporate firm, a big one. This has to matter enough to them that they're willing to do that, right? I mean, they've got to ultimately put their money where their mouth is. So I think who I attract is people that this really matters to, that they want to be. I mean, what I can offer is the flexibility is an incredibly supportive workplace environment is this incredible collegiality among the women in the firm. So people have to want that. They've got to find that really attractive. And I think there's plenty of people that would go running in the other direction. So I think that my hires have been intentional enough that there hasn't been nearly as much work as there otherwise would be. And I do have to say, like, I do try to get a lot of feedback from people on what's working and what's not. And sometimes, you know, I'll throw out an idea And it's just a miss. And I can just tell, like, I just proposed an idea to send off Brittany, who's leaving. And I thought it was this fantastic idea. And nobody seemed really (laughs) excited about it. They were like, that's too personal. Like, I'd rather write her a card. I wanted to make this whole, like, video for her about how she impacted our lives. And honestly, I was, like, a little bit hurt, you know, because I thought it was such a great idea. But 
but I respect my team and I respect that I'm dealing with some much more introverted personalities than my own. And, you know, and I just said, okay, I guess that's not how this one's going to go. That's so funny because I also am a TMI person. Uh (laughs) I tend to just put it all out there. And I feel like life is too short to not tell people how you feel. And especially if you love them and they've made an impact in your life. Yeah. You know, you learn so much that way, right? Like when you share, I don't know, I think sharing is just such a great way to connect. And I'm a real proponent of like, you're only as sick as your secrets type of thing. And so I feel like, oh, I don't have any secrets then I'm pretty healthy. And there's something about just talking about it and not being in shame around the things that you're not excited Mm -hmm. about in yourself and what's going on in your life. I feel like it's really empowering. So really quickly, I think that what you are describing is basically most women's dream transition. I think there's a lot of people who really enjoy the work they do and would gladly take a 60-70% pay cut with a commiserate mm-hmm. cut in hours, right? Mm-hmm. They want to do it. They just don't want it to consume their entire lives. Right. And they want to have the respect from the people they work for, for their personal lives to matter. So for people who are currently in a big law situation or in a more corporate, you know, larger firm situation who may one day be looking for something like this, is there a skill set or are there things that they should be trying to develop now while in that their current situation that would help them make that transition? Whether that means make them more interesting to a potential employer or just better prepare them for the transition? That's a great question. I guess if I just think about what my employees have in common, I mean, they're all really good at what they do. So I think just kind of going, okay, I'm going to really dedicate myself to understanding my craft. And also, I will say the one thing I think is really important if you're practicing in a this is maybe not the right word, but non-conforming kind of area of the law again. This, but if you're going to practice in a sort of a somewhat rebellious area of the law, not be in a white shoe environment, thinking, I spend a lot of time with my younger attorneys, less experienced attorneys, trying to get them to not think like a lawyer in that, okay, here is the most conservative approach. And if you take this approach, you'll never have a lawsuit. It's like, mm-hmm. no, that's really not that helpful. You yeah. know, like you've got to look at this company and what this company's risk tolerance is. And if you're not talking about an ethical issue, if it's just a question of, you know, regulators may come after you and it, no individual is going to get hurt in the process, then you really want to look at the company's risk tolerance and you want to look at the practicalities. And so things like that, like don't write the most conservative option every time, you know, middle risky, high risky, low risk. And what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of taking the various courses of action? But don't just think like a big corporate firm where you're going to say, well, here's what you need to do to CYA. So I think trying to start thinking about thinking outside the box. And then I guess just setting up your own life so you've got some flexibility around your income. And, you know, that that's hard. I think there's some hard choices that have to be made around what is most important. Yeah. Those are such good tips. And I think those are actionable tips, especially around, I mean, both of them, really. <laughs> I can mm-hmm. go into so much detail about both of them. And to be honest, the reason I got recruited to go in-house was because when I interviewed for the job, I didn't even really interview for the job. I met the GC for lunch because I was recommended and he said, let's just do a meetup. And the thing I said at lunch, which he still remembers and still reminds me that my job as a lawyer is not to tell my clients the answer. It's to give them the options and explain to them what the risks are associated with those options and help them come to the best answer for their business. Exactly. And he was just shocked that a big law Mm -hmm. attorney would have that perspective. Right. And so he offered me the job shortly thereafter. (laughs) So that really resonates with me. I think if you think about law, and I do believe this, I think you can put out who you want to be in the world through your legal career. I have a friend who heads up this organization, a a legal nonprofit, and she always says lawyers can be heroes. But if you look at it like that, I mean, that's why, you know, sometimes I'll I'll take an email that someone's about to send to an employee that they're going to terminate. And I will completely rewrite the email. And I'll say to them, this has nothing to do with legal stuff. This is just what kind of a culture are you creating? And what message do you want to send to this person? And just try to get them to really understand that 
this is someone's life here, you know? So what I find, and I'm always a little bit nervous to do it because it's so non-lawyery, but what I find is people are incredibly responsive. Like most employers want to be good to their employees. You know, they don't, they write an email a certain way in the CYA mode. And I'm like, yes, okay. I understand why you're doing it that way. And you can be so much kinder and so much softer in your approach. Not only is that going to be more in line with your mission, but believe me, that will pay off in terms of how this employee is going to interact with you in the future. I love that. I think communication and tone are often underemphasized in the practice. And so many lawyers could themselves use a lesson in bedside manner, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the way doctors kind of do. That's such a good takeaway for people because sometimes the point is correct. The substance is all 100%, but the tone and the manner of communication means it will not be digestible by the reader. Exactly. Or they're they're just going to get angry and then their response is going to be to sue or whatever. Yeah. So I'd like to transition really briefly to the work that you do through Joy in Law. So my understanding is that you started this organization and you have meetups and you have an annual conference and really your mission is to support women attorneys primarily in the Bay Area, but really help them in their journey towards career happiness. So obviously, (laughs) this really resonates with me. And I'd be interested in kind of the lessons you've learned in doing that work and kind of leading this group and growing this community. What are you seeing that people are hungry for? What guidance, what support are women really looking for to find what they need to promote their own happiness? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the biggest things for women is just community, community with other women lawyers who have the same hopes and dreams. Again, it's the sort of normalizing that, yes, I want this and other people want this too. And this is a legitimate thing to want. And I can use the resources of other smart women who have various things that I want to learn how to get those things for myself. I think a sense of community is huge. The groups that meet up around the Bay Area are women just because I think it just sort of is in line with my mission of really supporting women's growth. And I think women need this in a way that men don't, men just don't need it as much. They have a lot more resources. So I think it's mostly what women are looking for is like, they know they want changes, but they don't know how to make them. And I think that's what these groups allow is for people to just talk about. So I think just talking to other women and hearing how other women have done it can be really, really helpful. Creating these spaces is so important because I think there's this tendency of when lawyers get together to just self-deprecatingly complain, make jokes about how terrible it is to be a lawyer. It's like this thing lawyers do. (laughs) Right. It sometimes to me almost feels like an act of bravery to like say out loud in a group of lawyers (laughs) who I don't know that I actually just like being a lawyer. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And if you look at the history, I'm sure you know this, but there's all these books now about mindful lawyering and things like that. And they they talk about where lawyers came from. I mean, lawyers were traditionally the problem solvers, the peacemakers. They would kind of go back and forth between tribes and solve problems. And how lawyers have evolved to where they are, I think, is a real distortion of what law originally was and what it can be. And we have a great legal system in this country, a hugely flawed, hugely, hugely flawed one, but a pretty great system. And if we can all take responsibility for easing the parts of it that are not so much fun and are not productive and definitely don't bring out the best of one another, there's a lot of good there, you know, and it's just, it's really important to recognize it. On that note, I am going to transition us to the second segment of the show. So I call this the happiness hot seat. And these are just five quick fire questions that I like to ask every guest I have on the show. So first question, Diana, how do you manage overwhelm? That's kind of a tough one for me. But I I think one of the things I've been doing lately is I worked with the productivity expert recently, and I've been reading a lot of books on this. And I think the key thing for me is figuring out what needs to be done, putting it all on my centralized to-do list, figuring out how long things will take and how important they are, and then just starting down my list and remembering that if it's all written down, it will all get done. Knowing that everything's out of my head and on a piece of paper is incredibly stress easing, I think. Completely agree. I think sometimes the list feels bigger in our head 
And then yeah. when we start to write it down, we're like, wait, this is only like, you, yeah. know, like, you start to try to think of other things because you're yeah. like, I was feeling way more overwhelmed than was justified <laughs> by how short this list is. Right. Well, and don't you have that experience sometimes where like one day you're so overwhelmed and then you get three things done the next day and you're like, I have nothing to do. Yep. <laughs> you know, and you're just like, well, where was all that overwhelm coming from? Yeah. And that's the other thing is I just try to remember tomorrow I might feel completely differently. So number two, what do you do or how do you prioritize your own happiness? Well, I think one of the things I do is I delegate a lot. I don't try and do it all. And that gives me a lot of time to do the things in my life that give me meaning. I do a lot of self-care going back to the whole mothering topic. I think I'm a pretty good mom, but I've never been one of those moms who's like, yes, I've got everything is all about my kids. I think that I'm keenly aware that there's a direct correlation between how well I take care of myself and the resources that I have to offer them. And if it's all about them and I'm not taking care of myself, it's not good. (laughs) I'll tell you a funny story. So I I spend time going to 12-step meetings. And a few years ago, my daughter's seven now, a few years ago, she's still, she's very sweet. She never wants me to leave or go anywhere. She always wants me around. So I was trying to get to my meeting and I, she said, don't go to your meeting, don't go to your meeting. And I said, you know, mommy will be a much better mommy if she goes to her meeting. And my daughter said, you're always saying that and you don't get better and better. <laughs> <laughs> I was like busted. <laughs> so, so smart. I know. So anyway, but, but I generally really believe that. I'm like, I try to explain to them. I'm going to these meetings and I, I know it's hard and I'm leaving the house, but trust me, when I come home, I'll be such a better mommy. That's really cute. Yeah. So number three, can you describe a mindset shift that changed your life? A lot of my mindset shifts have come from Buddhism. I think one thing that was really big for me was kind of this concept of no self in Buddhism, that we have this really tangible, integrated sense of who we are, really strong ego identity, but that if you break that down that's kind of just an illusion that we're really just a bunch of life processes happening. And I think that's really changed my life because it's helped me not identify so much. Like, especially when I have dark moods, it's like, oh, this is just an emotion or these are just thoughts or these are feelings that are visiting. And this isn't who I am. This is an experience that I'm having. That has really been very powerful for me. I love that so, so much. Mm -hmm. Number four, can you name a book that has inspired you on your journey? So the Joy in the Law Conference was largely inspired by one of my favorite meditation teachers, James Barras, B-A-R-A-Z. And he wrote a book called Awakening Joy. And I love, love, love that book. And actually, he has now a book called Awakening Joy for Kids, which I Mm. also have read. Yeah, which you should read. It's great, great practices for working with your kids. So that is kind of my Bible and I read it and reread it a lot. And I also do his course a lot. And then I, just a recent book I read that I highly recommend a lot is called Essentialism. And that's basically about how do you figure out what not to do in your life, but make sure that you get the important things done. Yes. Essentialism and the one thing get a lot of shout outs on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, what do you think separates happy lawyers from those lawyers who struggle to find happiness in life with a law degree? I think a lot of that is just about following your internal voice. You can call it your internal voice or your authentic self or your higher power. But instead of focusing on other esteem and normalizing, instead to really trust your gut and to trust that the only way you're going to be happy is if you follow your heart. You know, I mean, I've had a very, very non traditional law career. I actually said I would never go to law school, but both my parents are lawyers. I always said I would never go to law school. And I think that was actually really great because when I did go to law school, it was like, it really was clear to me that so many of my interests converged with a law degree. And it also took off this pressure. Like I never wanted to work at a white shoe firm. And and so it allowed me to be really creative and a little rebellious in my lawyering. And that's made all the difference. That's so great. And I wholeheartedly agree. And I think sometimes we as lawyers don't think of someone who's practicing employment law as someone who would have that perspective, especially young lawyers, the nonprofit lawyer who's like on the front lines of the immigration issues, or those are the people who are passion driven, right? 
But when you hear the thing that drives people and the practice areas that they choose and the impact that they make in their clients' lives, they are also heart-driven choices. Definitely. All right. So before we wrap up, I have one question from a listener that I got on Instagram. And this is from M. Larbs. I think her name is actually Marion. So she asks, how may virtual law practice redefine how we practice law? I got a similar question from Savage Searching, which is how do you see the legal landscape changing with the opportunity of working remotely? And I think this is really, you know, like a high level question. What do you think could be the impact of remote work on the way we serve our clients? Well, I do think that you are going to see there's more availability to the client at sort of non-traditional times because you might be gone between two and five, you know, at your kid's game or whatever event. And so I think there's actually some great things for the client because the client may really have an, something really important they want to discuss with you at eight o'clock at night. And I know for me, I, that doesn't feel like a big ask because I've had a chunk of time with my kids earlier in the day. So I think less traditional working hours. And I, I, what I'd like to see and what I hope we'll see is more women, more, more people that are not conforming to kind of traditional law practice norms, being successful, mm-hmm. doing well, and still being able to hold their own personal values dear, like not working like a maniac. I'd love to say, and I really hope we do see a movement away from the billable hour We've tried to do that at Mary Law Group with a lot of our clients. And I think that that's ultimately a good way to go because I think it's really hard. Like, you know, one of the reasons we work such crazy hours is we have this system where we bill people based on how many hours we work. And so the more hours we work, the more money we make. And it's kind of a messed up system. If you think yeah. about it. so it's not based on value, but kind of how long it takes. And, and of course, sometimes it takes way longer than it should and you, you write off a bunch of your time. But I would like to say that as we sort of move out of traditional law, that things like that, like having everything based on the billable hour will fade away some too. And I think that would be a really great thing that would allow more lawyers to have quality of life and to make money based on the value they provide, not on the amount of hours they put into something. And I think you would agree with this. And I th- this touches on what you were saying about quality of life. I think that when lawyers are happier and they have a more sustainable way of practicing law, they are just better lawyers for their clients. And clients deserve lawyers who aren't exhausted, right? Who aren't like working around the clock. We all know it's the same thing with doctors. I mean, we all know that people aren't supposed to work as many hours as we're working and that we're not productive and we don't do our best thinking, our most creative thinking, working 14 hour days. Yet we ask lawyers whose skill set is all, is, you know, primarily intellectual based to do that and charge hundreds and hundreds of dollars an hour for that work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's a very good point. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that can be missed if you are exhausted and depleted. Well, I mean, because you see it in the medical profession with pilots, like there's a lot of other professions where they've acknowledged that there is a tendency to overwork. So they put caps on how much people can work. But in the law, we have this depraved (laughs) system that creates reverse incentives. So last thing before I let you go, what is the best way for listeners to follow you and learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, so there's a couple things they can do. They can go to marylawgroup.com, M-A-I-E-R-L-A-W-G-R-O-U-P.com. Look at our blog and subscribe to the blog. We also have a website, joyinthelaw.com. And there's a blog there that they can follow. And if they're in the Bay Area or gosh, if if somebody is not in the Bay Area and they were even interested in setting up a kind of a joy in the law group, they could just reach out and email me. My email's on the website, but it's diana, D-I-A-N-A at marylawgroup.com. If they're in the Bay Area, they can go to jointhelaw.com and then go to groups and they can sign up to be added to the groups. They can go to, we have a Twitter. It's just Group is the handle on Twitter. Yeah. So those are all good ways. They're just shooting me an email. They can follow me on LinkedIn. All those places, we usually have links to our blog and like join the law and the various things we're doing. Fantastic. And I will include links to all of those things on the show notes to this episode at thehappylawyerproject.com. Thank you so much, Diana, for coming so, on. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. And I think you're amazing. And I'm just so flattered to be on the podcast. Thanks so much for listening. 
And if you got value out of this episode and you think there's someone else who might enjoy it, I'd love for you guys to share. And if you have any questions for me, please head over to the website at thehappylawyerproject.com and you can leave me a voicemail right on the website. When you get there, you'll see a little tab on the right hand of the screen and you can click on it and leave a voicemail there. I absolutely love hearing from you guys. Last but not least, if you enjoy this podcast and you like the content that I'm bringing to you guys and you haven't done so already, I would really encourage you guys to head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and review. That's all for this week. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening.